Uh, my name is Brendan McGeever, I'm a lecturer at Birkbeck across the road. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the fifth uh, event in this series of discussions on the Russian Revolution. Uh, for anyone who's not been to one of these events, and I'm looking around the room and there are definitely some new faces, I just want to say a couple of things about the uh, series. <coughs> the talks are named Social Histories of the Russian Revolution. And what we mean by that is that we want to discuss how the revolution was experienced by the masses of men and women who participated in it. We don't want to brush aside the role of political leaders, but we want to sort of move beyond those more familiar debates to get a deeper understanding of the social dimensions of the Russian revolution. And secondly, these talks are not academic events in the usual sense. Uh, yes, our speakers worked in universities, yes, they published widely on these issues, but our speakers are here to discuss with you, people who are interested in the revolution, no matter how much or how little you know about the, these events. Also, the organising group, myself, uh, Simon Pirani, William Dixon and others, uh, hello. <laughs> are friends who are active in labour movements, social movements, um, probably like many of you were interested in ideas about changing the world. Um, we are hopefully going to video the talk, but it will just be uh, our speaker, Katie Curtin, who's going to be videoed, so don't worry about your faces being on this. Uh, I'm pleased that tonight's event will be chaired by <coughs> Liz Lester. Uh, Liz teaches women's and labour history at the Workers' Educational Association. She's been active in left-wing politics for a number of years as a trade unionist, as a chair of Camden Unison and Nalgo, and as a tutor for Unite. Uh, Liz is going to chair the session, but before that she's going to in, uh, say a few things and introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Katie Turton. Uh, Turton sorry. So over to you, Liz. Thanks, thank you. Okay, hi everybody. Um, Katie will speak for around half an hour. Um, and we'll then have at least another hour for questions, discussion, and further comments. In common with the way these meetings have been run, we want to be as inclusive as possible and encourage as many people to speak as possible. So it may be that if you've spoken several times, someone else gets called on first, okay? So I hope people will understand that, because we really want to have a lot of questions um, for people who may sometimes feel hesitant about speaking out. At the end of the discussion, we'll have a minute um, for anyone to announce any other relevant meetings, demonstrations, or um, events that they'd like. And after that, we will be going to the Institute of Education Bar, so everybody <coughs> is invited to meet and have a drink and continue what will no doubt be a really interesting discussion. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Katie Turton. Katie's a lecturer in European history at Queen's University Belfast, specializing in Russian and Soviet history. Her first book, Forgotten Lives, published by Palgrave in 2007, focused on the lives and work of Lenin's sisters, Anna, Olga, and Maria Yulianova. Her current research centers on the role of women and family networks in the revolutionary movement, with publications <coughs> including A Mother's Love or Political Statement, The Role of Maria Alexandrovna Yulianova in Her Family's Revolutionary Struggle, which was published in Women's History Review, her article, Children of the Revolution, Parents, Children, and the Revolutionary Struggle in Late Imperial Russia, was published in Journal of the History of Childhood and Youth. Tonight, Katie is going to speak to us about <coughs> Women in Revolt, the female experience of the 1917 revolution. Over to you. Thank you, Liz. Um, thanks, first of all, to Simon and to Brendan for inviting me to speak today, and thanks to Liz for cheering. Um, it's such a delight to be able to speak about women in the revolution on the 23rd of February, which is traditionally the start of the February Revolution, which was started by women. So it's, it's really a, a perfect storm, um, besides Doris, that you all battled through to get here tonight. And uh, since I'm talking about women in the Russian Revolution, I thought I would start with a man. Uh, <laughs> uh, a uh, completely familiar face to all of you, I'm sure, one of the leading figures of 1917. Um, and I want to read out his description of his experiences of the February Revolution in particular. Can I just check, can everyone hear me okay at the back? Yeah, okay, good. Okay, so what does he have to say? 
In those first days of the revolution, the Duma became the symbol of the state and the nation. By a determined united effort, a new authority and the rudiments of a new national structure were set up. I saw new forms of government shaped by men who the day before would have turned in horror from what they did that day with their own hands. They did it because something inexplicable, mysterious, miraculous had happened, that which we are accustomed to call revolution. This something lit up the souls of men with a purifying fire and filled them with love and readiness for boundless self-sacrifice. We forgot everything that was merely personal, all that was a matter of class or caste, and became for the moment simply men, conscious of our hu common humanity. It was a moment when every man came into touch with what is universal and eternally human. It was most exhilarating to see about me these men, so transformed, working together with sublime devo devotion for the common good. What's really striking about this description, as will not have escaped your notice, is that the revolution is entirely masculine in, in Kerensky's view. It's universal and eternally human, but women are not a part of it. It's men who are lit by this purifying fire. They are the ones ready to sacrifice themselves. It's men who find their common humanity and touch the divine, no less, with this miraculous event. And women are not part of it at all. In fact, they're implicitly rejected by the reference to forgetting the personal if we accept that that's where women are to be found, in the private, the domestic, the emotional. And in some ways, our understanding of the revolutions of 1917 haven't really moved all that far from um, Kerensky's perspective. Um, there are four key moments where women feature in the narrative of that um, miraculous year that revolutionary year. Um, obviously and inevitably we have the Tsarina, um, the cause of the, dar the Tsar's uh, downfall, her hysterical belief in Rasputin, her ignorant conservatism, her mother's love trumping all political logic, um, symbol of all that's rotten at the heart of the Romanov dynasty. We have the march of women on International Women's Day sparking the February Revolution, their desperation for bread, push, um, showing just how Russia had been pushed into uh, desperation by the war. Um, and obviously their appearance on the street seems to symbolise that great inversion that you always get with revolutions, czars reduced to beggars, um, women acting as men and so on. We've got women cropping up again in the defence of the Winter Palace in October. Um, the weak provisional government defended by even weaker and hysterical female soldiers. The emasculation of the provisional government demonstrated by its being defended by women. And lastly, we've got the emergence of Alexandra Kollontai, um, the first female government minister um, in history, um, overseeing the liberation of women and her act symbolising all that was idealistic about the Bolshevik programme. Um, Revolutions and symbols go together. Um, it, revolutions and symbolic moments go together as well. And women make great symbols. Um, women are other and separate. Um, and therefore they can be imbued with values. They can be reviled or revered, seen as exceptionally bad or exceptionally good. Um, the language of gender, of male and female, imbues uh, revolutionary rhetoric. Um, it imbues rhetoric about statehood, national identity. And of course, we've also got to contend with that assumption that all women are the same, defined by their biological destiny, and therefore when you have these individual women popping up in the history books, then they can, of course, represent all women as well. And once these symbols have been dealt with, historians can get on with telling the larger story about the revolution itself, about the male leaders making vital decisions, influencing key events. And because this story is universal, as Kerensky would have it, there's no further need to talk about women. Except that's not a very convincing story anymore, as women's historians for the last few decades will have told us. Um, women didn't begin the revolution on the 23rd of February only to go home and knit socks while their men folk take up the baton. 
The Tsarina and the Women's Battalion certainly become the focal point of discontent and rumour, um, but their place and role in the events of 1917 are much more complicated than these snippet um, moments that we see of them. And lastly, Kollontai and her agenda for the emancipation of women doesn't simply appear on the 25th of October 1917. The campaign for women's emancipation um, was, uh, had a much longer history and was much more diverse than Alexander Kollontai's interesting um, but individual life can ever encompass. So... What I thought I would do, um, rather ambitiously, um, is take you through the whole year of 1917 to try and get to grips with women's continual presence in that extraordinary year. Their um, persistent engagement with the big questions that 1917 posed um, and, and give a sense of um, more than their symbolic place in the revolution, their, their real actual lived experience. Um, now, because I'm going to try very hard to be disciplined, um, I will not be able to go month by month, but I'm going to give you some edited highlights of um, non-symbolic but important moments, I think, that need to be flagged up. One of the funny things about the accounts of 1917 you always find is that January gets sort of hopped over and we start, you know, 1917 starts on the 23rd of February often. But actually in January... Um, there is actually a couple of important um, moments that I want to flag up. One of the first things which doesn't always get mentioned is that, as had been done every year since Bloody Sunday in 1905, the first Russian Revolution, there were marches to commemorate um, that event, the, the cutting down of um, peaceful protesters by government troops in that revolutionary year. Um, and just as women had played a role in 1905, and that's a whole other talk, um, so too were they out on the streets to commemorate that um, event. It's also always worth taking a look at what the Okrada, the secret police, are saying about what's happening because um, their reports, above all, are aimed at trying to get to the truth of what's happening on the streets. And so they've learned by long experience that you can't not talk about what women are up to, from women terrorists to women revolutionaries and to women on the street as well. And their report from January 19th, one of their reports from... January 1917 is actually uh, quite striking. Mothers of families exhausted from the endless queues at the shops, suffering at the sight of their sick and half-famished children, at this moment are much closer indeed to revolution than our Mr. Milyukov, Rodichev and Co. from the Cadet Party, the Liberal Cadet Party. And of course they are more dangerous because they constitute a mass of inflammable material for which only a spark is sufficient to cause it to burst into flames. So. I like the fact that the Okhrana are on to the fact that women are a force to be reckoned with. Um, they, are, they have um, obviously specific discontents, but discontents that are shared by um, other um, men in Petrograd and beyond. Um, and they're aware of their revolutionary potential. And of course, they weren't wrong, because on the 23rd of February, International Women's Day, a strike, um, a demonstration um, was launched by women in the capital in Petrograd. Now historians still have a tendency to call it a spontaneous event and certainly there were spontaneous elements, um, women rushing off to get men to come out and join them and so on, but these, the march of the 23rd of February had been planned in advance. I think that's always important to, to recognise. In fact, um, women workers in the trolley car um, uh, park at Vasilevsky Island were so on the ball that before the 23rd of February they'd hopped off to the local regiment to check if they would be firing on the crowds on the 23rd. And when they got a negative response, no we will not, then they were prepared to, to join the demonstration. Um, and photographs um, you know, speak volumes about women's um, being out on the street. Here's calls to increase rations to the families of soldiers. Um, feed the children of the defenders of the motherland. <coughs> now, as I said, the history books tend to sort of stop talking about women on the 23rd, but they play another very important role in those events, and that is reaching out to the soldiers, um, trying to get the soldiers not to fire on the crowds. And obviously one of the other fundamental moments of the February Revolution is the moment when the soldiers go over to the people. And you can see here women... Um, beseeching the soldiers, you can see their outstretched arms, and the banner reads the eight-hour working day. Um, quite often women's slogans are reduced to bread. They're actually engaged with much bigger issues, including women's wor women worker rights.
Okay. Um, as I say, February the 23rd is usually the, the high point of, of um, women's place in the history books. But actually, the following mon month is as important, if not more so, um, for women's involvement in the revolution. Um, now, I'm going to go back to Kerensky for a moment. He's very proud of the fact that one of the first telegrams that he sends off as Minister of Justice is ordering the lease of um, Catherine uh, breshko breshkovskaya the grandmother of the Russian Revolution, ordering her release from exile and um, her being brought to Petrograd with full honours. Now here's a classic moment of um, trying to play on the symbolism, obviously, of what if, if Breshkovskaya has been released, if she's back in the capital, um, you know, this symbolises everything that's great about the revolution. But of course she had been an activist for decades, she'd survived Siberian exile, um, and as you might expect, she comes back as an activist, and she's going to crop up again um, in my talk. Now we all know about the 23rd of February International Women's Day March, but in fact there was another one on the 8th, International Women's Day again because of the, cal the two calendar systems. So women were out on the streets again on the 8th of March in huge numbers, again marking International Women's Day. And then they were out on the streets again on the 19th of March because the provisional government had, of course, issued a number of huge reformist proclamations, including universal suffrage. But uh, the women who'd been campaigning for women's suffrage knew that universal didn't tend to include women and there'd been no specific reference to it in the provisional government's announcement. So on the 19th of March the women's suffrage campaigners were back out on the street, 40,000 of them, demanding a meeting um, with Chikadze and Rodzianko um, to get concrete um, <coughs> guarantees that women would be enfranchised as well. <coughs> Chikadze hilariously claimed he had a, a lost his voice and had a sore throat and couldn't come to see the, the women. And Rodzianko immediately passed the buck and got them to go off and see Prince Lvov as premier of the provisional government. Um, but Lvov, in fact, held true to the um, promise of women's emancipation and um, said that women would be granted female suffrage. And this is one of these classic examples where we have to be aware when we're talking about women of the uneven progress of revolution by gender. So men's um, advance and progress in a revolution can often be at a much faster speed than it can be for women. And we've just got to watch that when we talk about universal rights that we, we remember to see how women are faring. Um, one last thing in March as well, the Bolsheviks get going, they revive uh, Rabotnitsa. There's a march for women's suffrage. Uh, keep going. There we go. Um, yes, the Bolsheviks, the um, editorial board of Rabotnitsa got back together again. They revived the publication targeted at Russian working women um, and managed to get a circulation of up to 50,000 um, in, in 1917. I'm going to carry on to April and then I'm going to begin to give you um, um, slightly less um, uh, month by month um, analysis. But I wanted to flag up as well. Um, yes, another important event in April. We're very. Uh, lots of accounts of Petrograd tend to be um, Russo centric when obviously Russia's empire was far more diverse than, than ethnic Russians. And um, this was a surprise to me as I started researching this, this uh, talk. Um, in April, we had the first All-Russia Congress of Muslim women. Um, and I think it's important to recognise that the revolution was a, an opportunity um, grasped by women across the Russian Empire. And at this Congress, they spoke about equality between men and women, the abolition of the bride price, women's right to divorce, and other social problems. We've also got soldiers' wives mobilising to go to the Soviet to ask for um, better... Um, uh, care to be taken of them, an improvement in their allowance, which the Tsarist government had first set up. They go to the Soviet asking for 20 rubles a month to see them through the hardship of their husbands being at the front. Um, Dan, as the leading Menshevik, in fact, refuses this request, and Co Alexandra Kollontai um, steps up to defend the, the women's needs and to try and make arrangements for them. Sorry. But I think it's also important to recognise that <coughs> Uh, women were involved, if you like, in the big political events as well. So April sees the first crisis for the provisional government, the formation of the coalition between the provisional government and the Soviet. And there are huge demonstrations either in favour of the provisional government, in favour of the Soviet. Um, 
it's very easy in the sources to assume these were male-only affairs, but women also took part in these demonstrations. They too wanted to um, see the best form of government for Russia to, to resolve their needs. And it's important to see women working with men on, on if you like, the big issues. Okay. May um, sees an important moment as well. This is the moment where um, the provisional government grants Maria Bochkarova the right to establish women-only battalions um, to see actual combat at the front. Um, obviously, the war is, continues to be a huge problem for, um, for Russia at this point, and Bochkarova wants to see women join the, the campaign to try and win the war for Russia. Is it really an it's important, I think, to include that here, um, not only for the boundaries that she breaks in terms of getting women into combat, but also to highlight the way in which women are diverse in their responses to 1917. Um, there are socialist women, there are uh, liberal women, there are women who are in favour of the war effort, women opposed to it, and it's always important to try and recognise the full spectrum of women's participation. <coughs> Funnily enough, this is a, a big enough event, in fact, to attract the attention of uh, uh, Lloyd George and Emmeline Pankhurst, who comes to visit, uh, to um, review the, the women troops and um, to, to try and um, bolster um, the pro-war sentiment in Russia. Um, again, thinking about the diversity of women's experiences, um, <coughs> Sophia Panina is someone that sh we should all be recognising as having a big role in 1917 as well. In, in some ways, she sort of she she starts on the path that, that Colin Ty finishes in the sense that she joins the provisional government in a, in a ministerial post, well, a deputy ministerial post, um, first um, <coughs> in uh, public welfare and then in education. She's a member of the Cadet Party on their central committee. Um, and um, she's um, a sort of a rallying point, in fact, for um, the cadet opposition to the Bolsheviks, um, which I'll come back to in a moment. Okay. I'm conscious of time wearing on. So let's move on to October then. Um, in some ways, women disappear even more from the October um, accounts of October than they do from the February Revolution. But again, they, they had a place. Um, Alexandra Kollontai is at the Bolshevik meeting that decides on the seizure of power. And women also participate both um, in the Bolshevik uprising and also in the defence of the provisional government. Um, this is one of the moments though, where we have to recognise that women were not in a leadership role and we might want to try and tease out reasons why, although there are prominent figures, they cannot really be classed as, as leading figures in October. Um, and so the main roles that we see women playing in the Bolshevik side in October is logistical, it's feeding the men, overseeing communications, um, offering medical support. Um, so Stites does argue that in fact there were more armed women in the uprising, the Bolshevik uprising, than there were defending the Winter Palace. Um, Sofia Panina crops up. Um, you'll all know, obviously, that the battleship Aurora was deployed by the Bolsheviks to, to threaten the Winter Palace as part of the Bolshevik seizure of power. Panina, which I, also I didn't realise, was part of a three-person delegation that went off to the battleship to try and stop them from firing unsuccessful but you can see how um, in 1917 people were beginning to get used to the idea that women could actually be talking to soldiers um, and representing their government um, and we also have to deal with the defence of the Winter Palace. It was in fact a mixed uh, group of men and women soldiers that defended the Winter Palace against the Bolshevik uprising um, the, the women soldiers are, tend to be accused of being hysterical. Um, hysterical is such a problematic word in history, always a weapon really used against women. And, and in almost every scenario that you see it, it tells you far more about the person saying it than actually the conduct of the person being accused of it. Um, 
certainly though the women were um, subjected to abuse beating and there were uh, um, three rapes that are documented as well in, in, in the aftermath of the defence of the provisional government so um, it was obviously um, a fraught um, experience of course, the last thing that we always mention about October, of course, is Colin Ty's emergence as the first proper full minister in a government as the Commissar of Public Welfare. But again, in some ways, what's even more interesting beyond October is November, the following month, because this is the month that uh, voting begins. The Bolsheviks maintain initially their commitment to the Constituent Assembly um, and Russia goes to the polls. And again, what we can see are women participating wholeheartedly. Um, women candidates are put on the, the ballot papers. Um, and in terms of turnout, 77% of men turn out, 70% of women turn out to vote. And again, this is a big moment where we can see women properly engaging um, in an active way with the uh, political opportunities and rights that they're being afforded. But again, we can't escape the results. So 10 out of the 767 deputies elected to the Constituent Assembly were women. So, so we've, we, we still sometimes find ourselves coming up against that wall where no matter the voting participation, in terms of the actual candidates being elected, women are still at a disadvantage. OK. So let me draw some conclusions, point to some of the directions we might want to tease out further and discuss. Um, Hopefully what I've indicated is that women were engaged with 1917. They took the opportunities, the freedoms that were granted to them by um, the provisional government and then by um, the, the Bolshevik regime um, and had things to say about the revolution. And, and um, both on the, the common issues, if you like, the gender neutral issues of the war, of what sort of government would be best for Russia, and then, of course, there were also, on top of that, specific issues which um, affected women particularly, which exercised them. They had to keep tabs on the government to push for voting rights, to push for better education rights, to get access to employment on an equal footing with men. Um, we have to acknowledge that they weren't leaders. Um, we have a few prominent individuals. But that doesn't mean that they weren't present. And I think that we don't necessarily give them the due recognition of the space they occupied in 1917. You know, you know, they were visible on the street. They took up provisional government um, discussion time. They were on the political agenda um, and were part of the common culture as well. Um, you only have to look at the steps taken to obstruct women um, in 1917 to understand that they were obviously encroaching into new territory. And tied to that, we've got to watch out for this word backward. Quite often when you read about Russian women, you get told about liberals and socialists' assumption that Russian women were illiterate and backward, uh, conservative, um, and sort of in, in hearty need of consciousness raising. Um, but if you look at the struggles that women have in terms of trying to achieve their rights, participate in the constituent assemblies, then... Um, Backwardness is something that can be seen in both sexes, um, and we, we maybe need to sort of de-gender that term. And my last point, um, as I wrap up briefly, quickly, um, nothing of what I have said is new. It has been documented for, well, decades now. Um, there is a blooming, um, vibrant women's history of 1917. What we haven't managed to do yet as women's historians is get into the grand narrative to change the discourse of the gateway texts, which still stick with their symbolic moments. Um, and that is one of the big questions that women's historians now have to grapple with, is how we get this story of 1917 integrated properly into the grand narrative. Thank, Thank you. you. Well done, Tom. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say there are seats. If there's anybody, there are spare seats. Okay, well, there's a lot of very, very interesting material there. Um,